What is up? It is Yoshi, and this is a new video series on the channel where I will be talking about different things that are not typically discussed within the toy collecting scene on YouTube. I see a lot of people talking about toys being very expensive. The hobby is a very expensive hobby and prices are just increasing. Every year it feels like the past four years we've had major inflation and things have gotten very expensive. I hear a lot of that talk, but there's not a lot of talk as to why that is the case. Because ultimately the MSRP or manufacturer's suggested retail price is not a made up number and there are a lot of expenses that go into where that number comes from. So hopefully this can provide some insight as to why toys are so expensive. Before we get started, I am Yoshi. I am a senior manufacturing engineering student currently. I will be graduating pretty soon, so I will soon be just a manufacturing engineer. Pretty cool. I have an education in cost analysis, material science, mechanics of materials, manufacturing processes, specifically injection molding and CNC machining. So that is a bit of my background on what we'll be talking about today so that, you know, I'm not just making this up. I've also been a toy collector for over nine years and have recently become a toy designer with a heavy focus on innovation, storytelling, and mechanism design. Everything costs money. That is the bare basic one sentence answer to all of this. But let's break that down a little further so we can get a better understanding as to where these costs are coming from. Raw materials. Like everything, toys are made of raw materials and raw materials cost money. The cost of raw materials typically fluctuates depending on the demand and the availability. So if the economy crashes, there's going to be issues. If there's issues with demand and supply chain, there's going to be issues. The cost is going to be higher. So, you know, in 2020, when we had the supply chain issues where a lot of the shipments were stuck, there were a lot of issues in pricing of things because there was more demand than there was supply. Toys are often made out of polymers, also known as plastics, okay? I think that's pretty common knowledge, specifically at least when talking about action figures, since that's what I mostly talk about. It's ABS, PVC, HDPE, LDPE, PP, and nylon, also known as acrylonitrile butadiene styrene polyvinyl chloride, high-density polyethylene, low-density polyethylene, polypropylene, and nylon. I will make a separate video about plastics if that is something you are interested in. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it here. Just a very, very simple equation to kind of help understand the idea of where the cost comes from with raw materials. Material costs per unit of measurement multiplied by the number of pieces being produced, whether that be in a day, a week, a month, or a year. And the material cost per unit of measurement could be pounds or kilograms, which is often what it is. Manufacturing. So obviously manufacturing is the big one when it comes to where a lot of the costs come from, because in order to get the product, it needs to be manufactured. Injection molding is the most common manufacturing method used in toy manufacturing. So this method requires the creation of tooling. Tooling is literally the aluminum or steel blocks. Typically when things are mass produced, it is steel because steel lasts longer. But aluminum is sometimes used for small production runs or just to test out a mold cavity. But tooling refers to literally that metal block, that metal, that plastic gets injected into in the machine. You can kind of see in the picture there, it's the plastic is already in there, but that metal casing around that is what we would call tooling. Just a simple equation to help visualize this. Machine cost, so the cost of the actual machine, so the injection molding machine, and the CNC machine to be able to cut out the mold cavities. You, those cost money, just the machines by themselves. The tooling costs money, so that's the actual metal blocks that are being cut. 
that plastic is being injected into. That costs money. The setup time and production run, which we will get into more detail. Tooling. All right, I already discussed tooling, but here is a slide kind of specifically for it. Okay, so tooling is created by a 3D model done on the computer nowadays where somebody has to computer aid computer aided drafting they use to model something on the computer and then they have to go into another program which is typically master cam that's what it's called to then create the actual cutout of what the mold cavity is going to be the mold cavity is the actual cut out area that the plastic gets injected to on the tooling somebody has to on the computer make all of that so you have to pay for the time to make that then it needs to be coded. Often these machines use G-code if everything is CNC ran, which CNC refers to computer numerical control. So it's just a fancy way of saying that it's a programmed thing that you can just get data from the computer, shoots out the program, the machine knows what to do. That's pretty much what it is. And then obviously the finish so especially in the toy industry the surface finish and the little details are very important those are often done by hand so if you want shiny surface or if you want more of a matte surface there are a ton of different surface finishes that can be achieved through injection molding and that often needs to be done by hand after the mold cavity is cut out and those surface finishes need to be refined so that it appears on the plastic how you want it to running a mold flow simulation is a way for the manufacturers to see what is the most ideal way to actually injection mold this. Simply, it gives all these parameters and specifications on how good or bad certain things will be in injection molding. It's very important to do this because you waste a lot of material if you don't do a simulation first. Just a little bit of an equation for the overall tooling cost. I came up with cost of time it takes to 3D model and the cutout of the mold cavity, the cost to CNC machine the mold that is cutting out the actual mold, the cost of manual labor, so the areas that are done by hand, and then the cost of the actual materials. All right, setup time and change over time. What is that? Setup time is a very common term that's used within manufacturing. It is the time it takes to set up the machine for the production run. So basically every part has its own tooling. So that tooling needs to be put into the machine. That's a part of the setup. Also, you need to set up the parameters and the programming to make sure everything is set for what part you are manufacturing. Change over time is another term that is used frequently that refers to the time it takes to switch from one production setup to the next. So if the same machine is being used for another part's manufacturing, that machine needs to have the tooling taken out of the part it was just doing. It needs to have the programming changed out. You need to put the new tooling in. That takes time. And also, not to mention, you got to clean up the machine so that it still works and it, your parts come out as intended. So all this is accounted for with the total cost of things. Training. Time is money. I've kind of been saying it already, but that kind of puts it in clear terms. Every time there's a new production cycle, the operators need to be trained on how to do their jobs. The time it takes the operator to learn a new thing, it takes time and then that costs the company money because that is time that's not going into the manufacturing process so it is just added time obviously labor goes into this so operators often get paid per hour so you're not only paying for the materials and the process you're also paying the operators and the more there is to do so the more demand or quantity of a product there needs to be more operators to work things out we covered that part of the cost analysis. Now let's move on to what I call the 50% golden rule. This is not an actual term, I made it up, but I feel like it explains 
the concept well and we will get into it so obviously the company needs to make money otherwise we're not getting anything at all so you know you can do as much complaining as you want about the cost of things but ultimately you're not getting anything if they can't make money because unfortunately things cost money so the company needs money to be able to do the thing it's kind of a whole cycle so what is this 50 percent golden rule that i made up i didn't make up the idea i made up the name of it to make it clear the supplier or the company needs to have a 50 percent profit margin to make money unfortunately we cannot just do break even where you simply make back the money that you put into it because otherwise there would be no profit so you need you need to have a high enough profit margin to be able to keep going with business otherwise you're not going to be in business for long the 50 percent is a good rule of thumb but some brands do have a higher profit margin typically the more successful a brand is and the more a company's overall profits come from that brand that brand is going to have a higher margin because they need to provide more direct to consumer direct to consumer is a way for a company to be able to directly sell their product to the end customer so you are the end customer we are the end customer the toy collectors who buy the company's product rather than having to account for the retailer also needing a 50 percent cut the company is now able to charge less for an item that would have otherwise been more at retail an example a toy with a $10 manufacturer's suggested retail price will allow the company $5 of manufacturing costs to do whatever they need to make that a reality. B2B or business to business is the most common way that companies sell products. So this is where a buyer is involved, which is the retailer. So this is where there's a retail that's in between the customer and the company. The company has to sell their product to the buyer. The buyer has to want their product. I think that is something that a lot of people are unaware of too, is when a company is doing business to business marketing, they need to pitch their product to the buyer and the buyer has to want it. If the buyer doesn't want it, it's not happening. So the company sells to the buyer and then the buyer sells to the end customer, which is us, the toy collectors. So if Target is the buyer, Target, buys a certain amount of quantity from the company and they now mark up that price so that they're able to also make a profit. Let's say the retailer needs a 50% profit margin. These are just made up numbers for the sake of understanding what we're talking about here. These numbers can all be changed, obviously. So let's just say that right now, retailer needs to make 50% profit. That means now that same toy that had the $10 MSRP only gives the company $2.50 to work with instead of that $5 because now they need to take into account that the retailer also needs to make money. What does this all mean? I do break this down a little more so that we can really understand what is going on here. When selling direct to consumer, a company has more flexibility in manufacturing costs while maintaining a lower MSRP. This is the best of both worlds. Customer is happy with the lower price. Company can put more into manufacturing. This is new tooling, paint applications, accessories, and packaging. Packaging does go into the end cost. So you are actually paying for the packaging as well. New tooling refers to when there's all new sculpts. So with action figures, when a figure is fully new tooled, that means they are a completely new sculpt and they do not share any parts with a previous figure. Paint applications are pretty obvious. There's different forms of paint applications that I will not get into here. But if that is something of interest later, I surely can. And then obviously accessories, you know what that is. The main downside about the D to C model is it relies on a minimum order quantity. And what that is, is basically the minimum amount of the product that the company has to buy from the manufacturing facility or manufacturer, to keep it simple, in order for the cost to be justified and so that they can still make money. The fewer items that a company produces in a certain production run, 
the more it's going to cost them. And you may be wondering, how does that make any sense? Because you think, oh, the less, that's less material, that's less everything. How does that make any sense that it's more expensive? It literally comes down to change over time and training time. Every time something is changed out, they need to train the operators on how to do that and the change over time to completely switch that machine out for what the new thing is gonna be. The more they have to do that, the more time they're basically quote unquote wasting and that's being money spent on nothing essentially. So the manufacturer will basically enforce a minimum order quantity and if a company cannot reach that, then it's not happening. All right, now B2B, business to business. So a company here has less flexibility in manufacturing costs while maintaining the same lower MSRP that the previous direct to customer model has. So if we're keeping the MSRP the same, now the company has less flexibility. This is the most accessible method of selling product. I mean, every time you walk into a store, every single product on the shelves is a B2B model. A company was getting that product onto store shelves and the store is now selling it to the customer. The downside about B2B is the supplier has less manufacturing costs to work with for the same MSRP that they would have had for a direct to consumer product. This is because the retailer also needs to make profit. So I always like to have a good rule of thumb. If you ever want to know how much money a company has to make something, and this applies for literally everything you can do the divide by four rule. If you bought something from Amazon or Target or Walmart or any store, it is a business to business model and you can divide by four. Whatever you paid, you can divide by four. That'll give you a very rough estimate because obviously things are not all perfect like that, but that will give you pretty close to give you an idea of how much the company had to work with for manufacturing sake. Is there a workaround to this? There's two solutions that also come with their own problems that a company has to deal with when it comes to this business model. They either have to increase the MSRP to allow for a larger manufacturing budget. So let's say they still want $5 to manufacture a $10 toy. Okay, well, that's not going to happen. The $10 needs to be increased. Or they need to sacrifice the manufacturing budget to allow for the same MSRP to happen. And this is often seen a lot where you see reduced paint applications, you see the lack of new tooling if a wave of action figures literally is all reused parts, and you see less accessories. So that is the two ways that you will see this being done. That is it. I hope I didn't bore you and I hope that was interesting and hopefully that wasn't too long of a presentation, but that is pretty much the basics of how cost factors into toys. Obviously I can go into more detail, but this provides a general overview. I would love to go into more detail, but I don't know if that's something that everyone else wants because I find this interesting and I like this, but you know, this might not be something that everyone, it's everyone's cup of tea, who knows? So thank you for tuning in. If you made it this far into the presentation, because you are very much so voluntarily watching a presentation. So I appreciate it if you actually made it this far. I hope you learned something new. I enjoy sharing my insight into things that you may have otherwise never known about. I like that I can bring a new perspective to things and hopefully talk about topics that have not been discussed in great detail before and to share something new along the way. So this is going to be hopefully a new way that I can contribute to the toy collector scene on YouTube, bringing in my knowledge and, you know, manufacturing stuff that has to do with toys that other people otherwise don't talk about, I guess. If you really like this video format or you have suggestions on how I should go about it, let me know. And also feel free to leave suggestions on other topics you may be interested in learning about. When making those suggestions, keep in mind that I mostly know about engineering and design. That's not to say you can't ask about something that may be different from those, but my expertise comes from engineering and design. So keep that in mind. And with that, I will let you go. Good journey.